There are times when the Earth isn't as stable as it seems. And it just kept coming. And it kept coming. And it kept coming again. And it was like riding a roller coaster. It was really a rocking and rolling. I just, in my wildest imagination, had no comprehension that Mother Nature could be that destructive in just, you know. Every year, more than a million earthquakes rattle our world. We don't notice most of them, but the ones we do give us new respect for our planet. Earthquakes happen when tension stored in the Earth's crust is suddenly released. To understand what causes these disasters, we need to travel to the center of the Earth. The enormous heat and energy here shapes the layers above, especially the Earth's outer crust. We can think of the crust as a jigsaw puzzle divided into about 12 tectonic plates. These giant slabs of rock hold the continents and the ocean floor. For millions of years, they've been drifting and colliding, pushed by the churning liquid mantle below. When they slip, grind, and crunch past each other, disasters occur. Some of the worst quakes happen when the plates get stuck and pressure builds. When they finally break free, energy is released as waves traveling through the ground. Geologist David Schwartz describes the process. The plates are moving past each other. They're pushing against each other. When the stress builds up to a critical point, they snap. And the snapping of the plates basically produces the seismic waves. That, that's the earthquake. These disasters usually occur at the boundaries between two plates. This is where we find faults, cracks and fractures in the Earth's crust where the plates inch along. Geophysicist Ross Stein explains. These faults typically at their base, let's say 10 miles down, are moving at a few inches a year. And when that earthquake occurs, when that rupture begins, that fault, that motion is going to accelerate from a few inches a year to about 5,000 miles an hour. And it's going to do that in three seconds. So this rupture of the fault is a catastrophic process, unlike hardly anything else in nature. Like ripples in water, the vibrations spread out in all directions, shaking everything in their path. The strongest shaking occurs at the epicenter, the place on the Earth's surface directly above the spot where the earthquake began. One of the worst quakes on record struck Alaska in 1964. It measured 8.5 on the Richter scale, a scale that measures the magnitude of a quake. The shaking lasted around four minutes, which is a long time for an earthquake. The ground ripped open and in some places sank more than 50 feet. We know how earthquakes happen and the great destruction they create. But unfortunately, we still can't predict them. These giant gashes in the Earth are reminders of our planet's awesome power. They are fault lines, fractures in the Earth's crust, where huge slabs of rock slowly grind past each other. Most faults we can't see, but here in California, the San Andreas Fault is visible at the surface. You can't have an earthquake without a fault. And I'm standing right now on what is perhaps the most famous fault in the world, the San Andreas Fault, that extends from Mexico down south, way up to Oregon in the north. This is one of the few places in the world where you can stand with one foot 
on one tectonic plate and one on another. In other words, this ground here is attached to New York and Iceland. The ground here is attached to Hawaii and Japan. The San Andreas Fault sits on the boundary between the North American and Pacific plates. It's called a strike-slip fault, a place where two plates collide and try to slip past each other. As these plates move or creep in different directions, sometimes they get stuck. The longer they stay stuck, the more tension builds and the bigger the eventual quake. In other places, the plates move smoothly past each other. These areas buckle as the Earth shifts. The changes are subtle. Roger Billum keeps track of these changes with his creep meter, a device that measures movement along the fault. A computer collects data every minute for a year. This jump in the graph tells him the Earth shifted about five millimeters in a couple of hours. A small shift like this can have huge consequences for us. That might not seem much, five millimeters, but it's affecting a long section of the fault, maybe five miles long, involving millions of tons of rock. Now, it, it really doesn't matter here. This is a nice sort of field that aren't any people. But further north, this creep process and the things that are happening beneath the, the Earth are, are, are far more sinister. The San Andreas Fault and its branches trigger more than 10,000 quakes a year. Sometimes the results are devastating. Just ask the people of Los Angeles or San Francisco. Over the last two decades, major quakes rocked both of these cities. Life goes on, but the risk remains. In an area this active, the next violent tremor could happen at any time. The National Earthquake Information Center in Colorado keeps track of every measurable tremor on Earth. Satellite dishes pick up data from seismographs around the world. Seismographs are instruments anchored to the ground to record the Earth's movements. During a quake, a needle suspended in the instrument makes a pattern of lines that tells how much shaking occurred. Waverly Person, who heads the Earthquake Information Center, watches these lines come in. Fast-moving primary, or P waves, arrive first. P arrival here, P arrival here, P here, see all this is New Hampshire, uh, there's a P there. This earthquake, I think, is not in the United States, but it's a pretty big quake. Probably, maybe south. This is just coming in. We don't even know where it is yet. This is an earthquake. Uh, this is the type of thing that just happened. We talk about prediction. We didn't predict this. We cannot predict. We cannot forecast. The earthquake is occurring. Within minutes, a computer determines the precise location and magnitude of each quake. This information is sent to the pagers of others who follow up and check for damage. People have recorded earthquakes for centuries. A Chinese mathematician built the first seismoscope almost 2,000 years ago. A pendulum inside this device moves during a quake. This causes the balls in the dragon's mouths to spill into the frog's mouths below. Measurements are a little more sophisticated these days. But even with modern technology, predicting a quake remains an elusive goal. Seismologist Lucy Jones explains. Earthquakes are probably fundamentally unpredictable. And a key to seeing why that's true is to understand that we don't really want to predict earthquakes. There are 20 or 30 earthquakes every day somewhere in Southern California, just Southern California. What we're trying to do is not to predict earthquakes, but to predict which of the earthquakes we have are going to turn out to be large ones. To be able to do that, there would have to be something different in the way a big earthquake begins than in the way a small earthquake begins. And as far as we can tell, there isn't a difference. To predict a quake, 
scientists need to recognize changes in the Earth that signal a quake's about to happen. They tried to position equipment in the right place at the right time to record the warning signs, but they haven't had much luck. History tells us where earthquakes are likely to happen, but just because a big quake is supposed to strike doesn't mean that it will. Earthquakes don't discriminate. They strike grassy fields and major cities with the same brutal force. Today, around 600 million people live in areas where damaging earthquakes occur. Since scientists can't stop quakes or even predict them, they're working on ways to make sure people survive them. The best way to do that is to keep structures intact. One major city prone to earthquakes is San Francisco. In October 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake stopped the Bay Area in its tracks. It measured 7.1 on the Richter scale. The damage was extensive. Like all quakes, damage was caused by the shaking of the ground as waves of energy traveled through it. Tremors sent vibrations through buildings and bridges, sometimes crumbling them to pieces. But the Loma Prieta quake did more than shake the ground. It was a wake-up call for engineers to retrofit all of the buildings and bridges in the area. Seismic retrofitting is a fancy way of saying making structures stronger for the next big one making them stronger while still allowing them to move. As engineer Chuck Syme explains, some movement is vital for a structure's survival. If you've ever driven across a long span bridge, like the San Francisco Open Bay Bridge, and traffic causes you to stop, and you sit in your car, and you can actually feel yourself being bumped up and down <laughs> in the car itself, and that's what we're feeling is the elasticity of the bridge. Uh, I call it the heartbeat of the bridge because if the bridge is not beating elastically, it's failing. And a good rule of thumb is if it stops beating, get off the bridge. It's no longer alive. As bridges and buildings move, they absorb the energy of a quake. These days, engineers rely on computers to figure out how much movement is too much. High-tech systems show them where failures might occur and help them design against disaster. In the Bay Area, famous landmarks like the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge are now being retrofitted or strengthened. On these bridges, rivets are being replaced by high-strength bolts. Steel plates are added to the towers and the bases of most bridges are getting additional support. We now know that many lives are lost during earthquakes, not because of the quakes themselves, but because structures could not withstand them. Engineers hope their earthquake-proofing efforts will ultimately save lives. The same forces that lead to earthquakes also make mountains. Around 50 million years ago, the Asian and Indian tectonic plates collided with incredible force. Neither would give way, so the land began to move up. What started at sea level is now the Himalayas, standing more than five miles high. This is the highest mountain range in the world, and it's still growing. And as it does, enormous stresses are building that must eventually be released. Nearly a hundred million people live around the Himalayas in a danger zone. In the last century alone, earthquakes here claimed the lives of more than 30,000 people. The area has been quiet for years 
but scientists think another big quake is overdue. Rebecca Bendick from the University of Colorado is one scientist keeping track of the situation. Global positioning satellites send her information that could provide an early warning. She's learning how the plates converge or push together to create stresses within the land. The crux of the matter is that we need to know how that total convergence is partitioned over the fault. If all 60 millimeters of convergence has to be accommodated in one place, on one fault, on this one narrow line, then the earthquakes we have there are going to be big and they're going to happen often. But if instead all of that strain is accommodated on several different faults, something like an accordion, then each fault can only be expected to fail less frequently and less violently. She and her colleagues also monitor an area in the foothills that is rising at an even faster rate. Signs of this uplift are found in the rivers that spill through the valleys. In some places, the land rises faster than the river can erode it, creating giant steps and treacherous whitewater rapids. Bendick takes a ride through these rapids to see how the area is changing. Those steeper places are corresponding to places where the uplift is, is quick, so quick that the river can't keep up. Um, this will give us clues about places to come back and do more intensive GPS research to try to pin down the uplift rate. Conducting research like this is both exhilarating and dangerous. But in an earthquake zone inhabited by people, the information is vital. 